It's a great pleasure to uh, now have uh, the conference by Nana Katrin luders Kalund from uh, Aarhus University in, Sweden, in Denmark. You are a specialist of uh, polar studies, as uh, now the field exists. You have been the uh, writer, the author of a book entitled Exploration in the Icy North. So maybe at some point it won't be anymore the Icy North. Our travel narratives shaped Arctic science in the 19th century. Thank you very much for being here with us and thank you very much for your presentation. 20 minutes, I'm sorry, and uh, 20 minutes straight. <laughs> One of the things that I find so fascinating about these uh, scientific expeditions is just how much of the work that actually takes place before they leave the shores and before they actually get off the ground. And in many ways, that's actually the focus of my talk today. So it's going to happen less in the Arctic and more in Denmark as they try to get this expedition up and running. In the... Um, Early weeks of 1902, the Danish newspapers were full of articles about the efforts of a really well-known author to try to organize an expedition to the northwestern coast of Greenland. The author's name was Ludwig Mulius Eriksen, and he uh, wanted to travel with a very small crew to an area known as Smith Sound. And he wanted to produce an up-to-date account of the culture and lives of the indigenous peoples in Uhoi who lived there. Munis Eriksson argued that very little was known about their cultures and their living conditions. He said that most of the data that we actually had available was taken from historical sources. And he contended that these were incomplete, if not completely flawed. The voyage to Greenland was part of Mulius Eriksson's broad ambition of writing a three-part investigative work on Greenland, Iceland, and the Faroe Islands. He wanted the books to focus on the contemporary social and political context in relation to culture and commerce in those three areas. Now, Greenland, Iceland, and the Faroe Islands were all colonized by Denmark. And at the time of his proposed plans, the three countries were still under Danish colonial rule. But the exact nature of the colonial rule in the three national contexts differed. In Greenland, the trading company known as the Royal Greenlandic Trading Company, or Kongli Grønlandske Handel, KGH for short, had dominion over both the colonial administration and a monopoly trade. Having a monopoly on trade meant that the KGH controlled the import of goods going into Greenland and the export of products as well. And they determined who were allowed to purchase goods in their stores in Greenland and at what price. The KDH was founded as a state-owned trading company in um, 1774. Previously, the trade in Greenland, as well as in Iceland and the Faroe Islands, had been privately managed on an on-off basis, but they had troubles keeping it profitable. So the government took over and they implemented several reforms that were designed to extract higher profit margins from the trade. These reforms included uh, the introduction of general tariffs that determined the price of products and new colonial inspectors. And this introduction of colonial inspectors um, was part of an aim to streamline the colonial administration of Greenland. And they divided the country into two administrative zones, as you can see on the map, north, and south. An inspector was assigned to each zone, so you have an inspector in the north and an inspector in South Greenland. And it's really important for the context of this paper to emphasize that these inspectors were not simply working to ensure that the trade was running smoothly. They controlled the trade and the administration of civic life. And the inspectors then functioned as the colonial government on site. And this was also highlighted in um, 1974 when the KGH celebrated its 200-year uh, anniversary. 
Here they noted that, quote, inspectors were also given the highest judicial authority in Greenland and through strict instructions for the association between Greenlanders and those who were sent out, they sought to protect the local population, end quote. Oh, and all the quotes in this presentation are my translation, so that's why they might be a little wonky. Um, so from the beginning, the KGH was designed to, in their own framing, to protect Greenlanders and to make money for the Danish state. So they had those two aims, at least. Uh, so at its core, uh, Danish colonial policies in Greenland were shaped by what we call a paternalistic and racialized attitude to Inuit. And by paternalistic, if you don't know that term, I mean that the colonial government presented itself as being in a parental relationship to Greenland as a caretaker of a child that could not manage themselves. This was a racist view of Greenlanders, which presupposed that if left without this colonial governance, the indigenous peoples would succumb to vices introduced by foreigners. So it framed the colonial government as a benevolent caretaker that was necessary for the good of Greenland. So as the colonial administration um, was managed by the trading company, they essentially had complete control over all aspects of civic life in Greenland. And this meant that they could control who was allowed to travel to the country. And they did not want Mulius Eriksson and his expedition. In the end, Mulius Eriksson was only able to travel to North Greenland because he was successful in lobbying the Danish Minister of the Interior to overrule the KGH and then order the trading company to assist his expedition and allow them access to the country. So why was that the case? And what does the KGH decision to reject the expedition and the Danish government's move to then overrule the KGH, what does it tell us about the relationship between exploration and Danish colonial rule in Greenland? And that's really the topic of my talk today. Um, as I'll show, Mulius Eriksson and his co-travelers were part of a broader discussion where the practice of exploration and the persona of the Arctic explorer was shaped by efforts to reform the monopoly trade. And defining or redefining who was an authoritative observer in the Arctic was key in this. And it draws our attention to the complex way in which this persona of the scientific traveler and the knowledge they produced was socially constructed. Emilius Eriksson, he was a journalist and an author. He had written several socialistic uh, novels and plays about life in the area that he grew up. He grew up in a very rural part of Denmark. He moved to Copenhagen as a young adult, um, wanted to read the law, but then dropped out, and he ended up writing as a journalist for the newspaper Politiken. This newspaper was founded in 1884, so it was relatively new when Emilius Eriksson joined. It's significant to note that the editorial board was staunchly anti-nationalistic, and they brought articles that advocated for political reforms with the aim of lowering social inequality. And sort of that's to say that Mulius Eriksson was associated with Copenhagen-based people who were considered radical thinkers at the time. And like many of these people, Mulius Eriksson was also highly critical of the Danish colonial policies. The official stated aim of Mulius Eriksson's proposed Greenland venture was for the crew to immerse themselves in Inuit culture to learn more about their society, both historically and in the present. And they wanted to collect personal life stories, myths, and uh, religious narratives. Now, these were all aspects that typically would have fallen under the rubric of ethnographic or anthropological research, which had always been a central part of the scientific aims of past European and New American Arctic expeditions. And just like uh, other past Arctic explorers, Mulius Eriksson wanted to collect anthropometric data. He wanted to measure Inuhoi, quote, just like detectives measure criminals after Bertillon's system. In this way, we can deliver as accurate a portrayal of their appearance as possible, which will enable researchers to determine whether they belong to the Asiatic or Indian groups. And this will help solve the interesting question of whether Greenland has been inhabited via the northern shores or via the southern shores, end quote. So, from quotes like this, it doesn't seem like there's anything particularly unusual about this expedition, which could explain why the KGH was so against it. We see here that he was proposing to undertake a type of ethnographic research that would, for example, provide data for that important question about uh, human migration patterns. 
And yet, Müllis Eriksson, he himself portrayed this venture as something new, as a type of practice that was different to what others had undertaken. While Müllis Eriksson was planning his expedition, the American explorer Robert Peary was actively attempting to reach the North Pole, and he had been going in and out of Greenland for years at this point. Peary and his co-travelers had published a lot of ethnographic data from their visits to the northern part of Greenland, the same place that Mulius Eriksson wanted to travel to. And he'd even brought back to the US uh, six Inuhoi. Um, and you may be familiar with the horrible life stories of these people, in particular that of Munich pictured here, who was then adopted by an American family after his father died. Now, Peary took these people back to the United States with him because he wanted to bolster his research credentials. It was important for his ethnographic like, persona. And he also wanted to earn money by enrolling them in the exploitative practices of uh, living foreign people shows. In addition to Peary's ventures, um, there had also been three American and one British expedition going through the same area that Mulius Eriksson wanted to go through. And they had also undertaken various degrees of scientific research while there during the second half of the 19th century. These expeditions, um, all had geographical serving as a primary aim. Most of them wanted to find the North Pole, or attempt to get there at least. Um, and then they had scientific research as their stated secondary aim. So as with Peary's expeditions, the four Smith Sound ventures listed on the map all resulted in published travel narratives that recounted their experiences. And they included detailed information about their encounters with Inuhoi, Descriptions that were incorporated into the ethnographic and anthropological body of knowledge about the Arctic regions in the European and Euro-American centers of learning. It's also um, interesting to note that all four of these expeditions included the Inuk explorer Suesak, known as Hans Hendrik. Following Kane's expedition, and that's the, the first one, the Grinnell expedition, Suesak actually stayed in the area by Smith Sound and married a woman from the community there. And Suezak and Meku, who was his wife, um, they participated in the second and third Smith Sound expedition together. And Suezak then again went uh, as part of the fourth Smith Sound expedition. And as an Inuhai woman, Meku had also shared this knowledge about her own community with the explorers her and her husband traveled with. So with this in mind, consider then how Mulius Eriksson described the current state of knowledge about Inuhoi, this community. He wrote, quote, the by Smith Sound nomadic Eskimo tribes counting approximately 250 individuals, the most northern people on the earth who have not yet been studied systematically, is thus the focus of the expedition, end quote. But Inuhoi, such as Minik and his relatives who were taken to the US, and Miku and Suesak who worked with the uh, Smith Sound expeditions are examples of how the communities in Smith Sound were not as isolated as Mulius Eriksson made it seem. He further wrote, quote, the expedition which will depart from here in the month of June will be the first Greenland expedition that has as its primary focus to study the nature people, both Christian and heathen, socially and folkloric, and produce a comprehensive image collection of nature and humans and collect materials to enable the evaluation of questions pertaining to the extractions of the wealth of fish in West Greenland. So when Munis Eriksson claimed that his expedition would be the first to have the detailed study of Inuhoi as its primary aim, it was both an overstatement of his own project in relation to what had previously been done, and it was a mission statement that signified himself and his crew as different types of knowledge, knowledge makers. And this is particularly clear in an article Mulius Eriksson wrote about Peary in 1905 for the newspaper Politiken. Here, Mulius Eriksson noted that because Peary was attempting to reach the North Pole, one shouldn't expect any scientific results from his projects, other than just basic mapping, which he thought was pretty easy to do. Peary was only a man of sport, Mulius Eriksson remarked, while the explorer Fridtjof Nansen, who was Norwegian, was a man of science. Whereas Nansen had, quote, studied Greenland's indigenous peoples and fought for their rights, Peary had only exploited them for his traveling purposes, end quote. And it's pretty clear what Mulius Eriksson is doing here, I hope. Yes, other explorers had visited the area of Smith Sound, and they had had contact with Inuhoi. But people like Peary had the wrong motivations. And as such, their observations about Inuit culture and society was clouded by their own selfish behavior and desires. 
as he further argued, quote, the Eskimos fear Peary more than they love him, end quote. And that meant that you could not use Peary's ethnographic observations because they had been shaped by that fear, all the interactions had been shaped by that fear. Now, of course, when considering Mies Eriksson's uh, quite severe critique of Peary, it would be good to remember that the geopolitical context that's happening at the time, because several countries were eyeing for uh, control over Greenland, and the Danish colonial rule didn't actually extend to all of Greenland either. So the way that Mies Eriksson is criticizing Peary's quest for the North Pole is something that isn't particularly scientific or impressive, really. Um, and the way he devalues geographical mapping should also be seen within the backdrop of these broader geopolitical events. But for our purposes, the key is that Munoz Eriksson portrayed himself as an opposition to someone like Peary, and he devalued the ethnographic research that Peary had undertaken in Smith Sound. But there's also a tension here. We can see that Munoz Eriksson portrayed his Arctic venture as being able to produce a more accurate and useful description of Inuhoi culture, in contrast with what people like Peary had done. But at the same time, the trading company, the KGH, they rejected Mulius Eriksson's application to go on the grounds that his was not properly scientific in focus. So Greenland was a close country. This was what several Danish newspapers reported in early 1902. Variations of this article appeared broadly, and they lamented that, quote, a half-private company, the Greenland trade, can close a country off for all unauthorized, both Danish and foreign. Only a declaration by the interior minister can, against the wishes of the company, open the access to the coast of Greenland. The newspapers actually also touched upon the fact that Munus Eriksson had, had previously tried to visit Greenland, and he had tried to join the Danish explorer Amtrop's expedition, but had been rejected by the trading company. And according to the newspapers, which obviously was sensationalizing this for the stories, but according to them, he had been threatened with being arrested, like violently arrested, if he had actually gone up there. Um, but then a few years, uh, sorry, a few weeks later, a few weeks later, um, the newspapers could report that the trading company had now officially rejected this expedition. So now it was official, he wasn't allowed to go. They also reported that Mulius Eriksson was appealing the decision with the Minister of the Interior. But this article also uh, pointed to a problem for Mulius Eriksson, that even if the uh, Danish minister, the Danish government, overruled the KGH, he still needed their support once he was in Greenland. So it really wasn't particularly smart to like, make enemies with the trading company either, because the KGH could just work against him. Um, by not ordering the local administrators to support them. And they would do this because the trade maintains that it does not want journalists in Greenland. Mulius Eriksson would later look back on this period and note that the most difficult challenge of all of this was that they didn't want a journalist going to Greenland and that they saw his application to go as a, quote, direct consequence of the system change. The system change, which he refers to here, is a change of government. The, um, the Danish parliamentary election in 1901, so this is 1902, so it's around the same time, had shifted the government from a conservative uh, to a more liberal one. The older party, Hoya, which means right, doesn't exist anymore, um, had been in power since 1875, so for about 25 years. And they had overseen all the previous attempts to uh, reform the trade and had uh, generally opted against reforms. Then the new government was set by the party Venstre. So Venstre means left, so it's positioning itself to against the other party. And this new government, as a reform party, was interested in revisiting the organization of the KGH and the way the Danish state generally ran its colonies. They took power in the summer of 1901 and then overruled the KGH rejection of Mulius Eriksson's proposal already in March of 1902. And so the expedition finally went on its way. So there was a very long buildup to being allowed to go, 
most of the work really takes place before they actually leave the shores. They set out in, um, yeah, in June 1902, and pictured uh, from left to right is Johan Brønlund, Alfred Bertelsen, um, Ludwig Mjørs Eriksen, the author, and Knud Rasmussen and Harald Molke, uh, Molke, Molke, Harald Molke. Probably the most well-known of the crew members was Knud Rasmussen. There we go. You'll probably have heard of him, um, if not the others. Uh, Mjørs Eriksen and Knud Rasmussen had met each other in Iceland. Um, Knud Rasmussen, he grew up in Greenland and he spoke the language fluently and this was really important because the expedition aimed to collect accurate life stories. So having someone who spoke the language fluently and who was also trained as a journalist, as Knud Rasmussen was, was a real coup for the expedition. So they spent their first winter in Ilulisat and continued to watch Upanavik in early 1903. From there they traveled north and uh, they then spent the summer winter of 1903 by the area of Saunders Island, which is shown on the map. And then they traveled back south in um, early 1904. During their stay, they had uh, interviewed several Inuhoi about their lives, and they had actually also brought a phonograph to record songs and music pictured here, which was also part of trying to establish that what they were doing was collecting uh, authentic data from the region. After uh, their return, Mulius Eriksson wrote several op-eds and gave lectures that were highly critical of the trading company. For example, um, Mjus Eriksson and Knud Rasmussen, they gave a joint lecture at a student society in Copenhagen where they described their findings. And according to Politiken, which of course is the newspaper that employed Mjus Eriksson, Mjus Eriksson had, quote, attacked the directorate's messed up rule of our Greenland colony with its large expertise with which no one else can comp at home can compare and with a power and authority in the lecture. In addition to this uh, critical lecture, um, Mjus Eriksson co-authored an illustrated account of the expedition with Harald Molke, who was a painter, and he published a, a book of poems inspired by the trip. Um, so the poem is in Danish, and my translation isn't great. Am I out of time? <laughs> okay, well, I won't read you the poem then. Um, the main point is that the poem was, and his... his um, his books and his lectures were exactly as critical of the KGH as the KGH has feared, right? So um, he had seen and reported on the detrimental effects of both the trading company and the village's mission. His reports on the situation in North Greenland were reported widely in Denmark after he got home. And he was really good at working the newspapers. He was really good at working the lecture scene and he was invited to give evidence to the Danish government. And this evidence was incorporated into this here, a reconsideration of the management of the trade. And they basically recommended that all aspects of the trade was reconsidered. And they said, we need more evidence. And of course, Mulius Eriksson obliged and he set out to organize another expedition to collect more data for the um, investigation. So um, to conclude, the commission's findings were published in 1908 and their recommendation was essentially a complete restructuring of the KGH. The only dissenters were the KGH people who had been invited to participate in the commission. And Munis Eriksson's vision for the literary expedition really broke with the traditions of Arctic exploration in several ways. Rather than traveling in search of a geographical aim, they went to an area that was already charted on the European maps. The crew did not have military, naval, or scientific backgrounds, but included instead experienced writers and painters. And they did not frame this using the language of the heroic Arctic explorer, which had been so prevalent up until this point. But to a large extent, the differences between the types of work they undertook in terms of the data collection um, once they were actually in the Arctic really wasn't so dissimilar to what other explorers had done. The key difference is in the framing. And this was explicitly done to create a division between previous anthropological data and their findings. So by framing it as a journalistic venture, 
they renegotiated what what sort of constituted authoritative knowledge production in the Arctic and what could and should be used as the basis for influencing political decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much to, for bringing to the floor uh, a new area, the, the north, but we will have the opportunity to, to come back to the north uh, later this afternoon. And also to, to enter into the, the discussion, uh, uh, another kind of media, the, the journals, which are very interesting in the way in which they are uh, uh, an option in order to create authority against power, against different types of power. So thank you very much for this. If there is one or two quick questions in French, if you want, we, and if you need, we translate. Yeah, I'll need that. That's OK. Uh, uh, so she can do it. <laughs> Simon. Can you say just a little more about the exact meaning of literary? You've said some really fascinating things about that. Not heroic, not experienced, not unknown. But are there other mm -hmm. features of the decision actually to build that into the title of the project that you want to tell us about? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, I would love that. Um, the, um, the term literary expedition was... Um, was a compromise for the expedition because the, and this is where the tension between who is an authoritative observer really comes in because the, the trading company didn't think this project was scientific and they didn't want it to be called a scientific investigation. Of course, if you had called it scientific, then it would have been harder for them to uh, reject their findings. With it being literary, it was just an extension really, or could be framed as just an extension really of what Mules Eriksson had written before, which was critical social realistic descriptions of the area he grew up in. Of course, you know, the naming didn't really matter in the end, because in the end, the political climate at the time was for reforms, and they wanted this data, and it didn't matter to them that it was called literary, it didn't matter that it was called journalistic. But there's a signal value in it that really shows just how resistant the KGH was for this type of you know, um, a visit from non-approved peoples going up to North Greenland. They thought that he had a political aim with the expedition, which I, you know, I think is fair to say he did, so they were probably right in that assessment. Um, and they thought that the types of explorers who had previously gone up were easier, I guess, to control and easier to use the data they, they had presented or created uh, in a desired way. Just a quick comment on that. I think what it, what is is so so clear in in your example, which I think is probably also um, exists in in earlier periods, but with with less clarity is the fact that um, those who go on expeditions, those who go on voyages, are always writing against a particular kind of backdrop. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the dangers of thinking about the, you know, the voyage savant um, as um, in the way that often they presented themselves as being you know, uh, ob objective observers and collectors and having that participate in some kind of uh, e elaborate catalog of the world as it, as it was um, is precisely that those uh, backdrops get obscured. And I think the, the manipulation of the genre and even the title uh, shows very clearly here that, um, uh, that they were conscious of of that, perhaps other other folks were not as conscious of the need to manipulate their um, their their rhetoric in in the same way. But 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 I actually think that's probably not true, um, because you see in the prefaces of even 18th century accounts, there is always this desire to already be articulating a kind of a perspective. So that was just you know a comment. Uh, toward um, how, how clearly it, 
it seems that you've laid it out in terms of the the the, um, the, the contact the broader context. Yeah, thank you. I think it's fair to say that these explore, expeditions were always always riding backwards as well. They're always positioning themselves in relation to what had gone before. And it's in that tension, that nexus between what had, what had been done before and what were the desires of their sponsors and their own desires as well, and what were the aims, and what were they hoping to achieve with it. And all those things always come together under the guise of being scientific and being objective. But once you start breaking it apart, you can see just how shaped it was by that broader context and how important that self-portrayal as someone who is an expert, how important it was for these people in order to just get out of Denmark, get out of the country that they were in. Because people had to say, like, why do we want to, why do you want to help you do this? Like, why are you the right person for this project at this particular time? And that self-portrayal was really key in that. But m maybe at this point I, I jump into the marmalade with, out of ignorance. The issue of labeling it literature could have something to do with the idea of a long tradition of literature referring to this area. And so creating a sort of genealogy where they wouldn't be the explorers, but the renewal of the northern literature. You see my point? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, that's certainly like also a, a huge part of it. I think for Midas Eriksson, I think it was the journalistic factor was very much what made him, like what gave him a raison d'être for this thing. You know, it was mm. it, that's why it was he was different, but mm. in a good way, right? Different in, sure. in the right way. Uh, always <laughs> in a good way. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very sorry we have to close this uh, fascinating discussion.